Hello and welcome to today's webinar presented by Weikert Workforce Mobility. Our topic today is sustainability and workforce mobility. And with close to about 200 registrants for today's session, it's easy to see just how critical this topic is becoming uh, for workforce mobility professionals. So pretty much everyone in every facet of our business, whether you're a company with a mobile workforce, a relocation management company, or a supplier, or or company that plays a role in mobility, sustainability is, is, is the common denominator for everyone on this planet. And over the next hour, our experts are gonna offer some insight to ways that you can help drive sustainability through your organization and uh, in particular through your mobility program. With that, I do want to get to our panelists. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on credentials or backgrounds. Each of our panelists is on LinkedIn if you'd like to do a deeper dive, but for now, I will just welcome uh, Laura Levinson, who is the practice leader in Weikert Workforce Mobility's Advisory Services Group. Uh, Bob Gallucci, who is the Senior Vice President with Hildrup Moving. And Mark Bicocci, he's the Senior Manager of Global Mobility with Hilton Worldwide. And I want to thank our panelists for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. And Thank you, Tim. Before we get started, we do have a quick poll. So... Our first question, which of the following have you implemented to make your relocation programs more green? And uh, for this question, we are really talking about the green aspects of so sustainability, but throughout the presentation, we're gonna address sustainability on a greater scale. So for now, just the green parts. So um, your choices are decrease the weight of household goods shipments, provide incentives to employees who make green choices, provide cash in lieu of home finding trips, or none of the above. And none of the above, we won't judge you. That could mean that you're thinking about it, but you haven't yet um, come to any conclusions. Below it says, organizers and panelists don't vote. We'd also appreciate it if, if you happen to be a Weikert employee, please also don't vote. Um, and while we're waiting, I'll just start by talking a little bit about uh, what's going on in the sustainability world, which is that I think most people on this call will know that Canada, Europe, and Asia have taken the lead on sustainability um, management and sustainability issues. But there's definitely momentum gaining in the United States. Um, really because uh, companies are starting to see all the value in not just, um, you know, frankly, to the environment, but also in terms of profit. So um, people, planet, profit, that's the motto, right? If we can make it better, make it better planet and help the people and preserve the profit, well, then we're doing something right. So actually, wow, this is interesting. So the large majority of folks haven't really done anything. Wow, okay. Um, I am a little surprised, but the good news is that just leaves a lot of opportunity for improvement, right? So um, any comments or thoughts from either Mark or Bob about this before we move on? I'll give you a comment. This you know, what we see on the household goods side of it um, is I think companies are taking the position that they're starting to work with caps on what they're willing to ship uh, for some of the transferees. So with the decrease of the weight of the household goods shipments, if you see on your screen is 13%, I think that some of these companies are really giving these transferees a little bit of a guideline on on what they're willing to to relocate and move so you're not taking everything in the home to throw it out on the other end so with doing that it gives them a little bit more uh notice on being selective on what they take or they have to go into their own pocket to to move it and uh, we see that a little bit more and more so great thank you yeah i would i would definitely say that I would have expected your area, household goods, to be the one that had any anything at all going on. Well, the good news is we have a lot to share with you today that hopefully will be very useful um, as you go back to your organization. So moving along, we'll talk about the business case for sustainable practices. We'll go ahead and take the liberty of defining sustainability in terms of the past, the present, and the future. 
And then we'll hear from uh, Mark and Bob in that order, talking about the initiatives that are taking place in their companies. And it's interesting because Hilton is both a client and a provider in the sense that uh, you, you know, you're obviously very much impacted by what's happened in the last year or so with the, you know, the the curse word, the C word. <laughs> and then we'll wrap it up with um, silver linings and some of the lessons that have been learned um, so far when it comes to uh, sustainability. And we also, of course, would like to encourage you to ask questions along the way using the chat feature. We will keep an eye on it. And uh, I'm going to take the liberty of interrupting my colleagues here if uh, I see some good questions coming in when I can. So, First and foremost, we talk about sustainability and what it really means. Um, these are two really interesting uh, definitions right here that you can read. Um, I think the most common current definition would be meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to thrive. And uh, there, is an, an, there is an acronym that is used often in sustainability, for those of you who are not familiar, it's ESG, which refers to environmental, social, and governance practices. Those are like the three pillars of sustainability. So if it meets any of those, then it's cons considered part of sustainability. So as I said earlier, a lot of us tend to think of green, anything that's green as sustainable, but it goes way beyond that into uh, governance requirements and, and a huge amount to do with workforce and people. And, and obviously in our business, that's the one I think where there's the most potential. So you can move on, Tim. Thank you. So we have our definitions, right? Um, the definitions for the recent past of sustainability has to do with, I, I don't want to say simplistic, but um, the, the things that are very visible, very easily apparent, you know, things like using mass transit or donating reusable items, um, proper um, Disposable of waste and reducing household goods shipments, as examples, are certainly um, ways in which we reduce cost and we reduce waste. Um, water consumption is huge. We we sometimes take it for granted in the United States, but as we've had recent crises, we we see how important it is uh, to have clean water sources, and the list goes on. Um, but it's not only about in terms of the recent past; it was more about our own initiatives. And now as we move into the present, it has more to do with also the relationships that we have and the partners that we choose and their ability um, to be more sustainable. So in mobility terms, as I said, I started to say, um, sustainability also refers to an improved employee experience and the ability be, for your company and, and your providers to be more flexible and agile in the way they make decisions about who goes on an assignment and for, from the provider side, the way the services are delivered. So Tim, let's talk about um, a little more moving forward into where we are today. And I kind of like to use the visual of a half, a half full and a half empty uh, glass. So on the half full side, you know, we have, definitely started to see more green partnerships and more emphasis on things like not only looking for providers and partners who are minority women-owned businesses and, and things like that, but also green partnerships, companies that are really taking advantage of the opportunities to do all these green things. Um, and then energy efficiency too. That, that's, that's something that people do in their homes. Um, I referred to those Tier, there actually I didn't. Sorry, <laughs> I want to tell you about the three tiers of sustainability, and those are tier one, what we do as individuals. Tier two is the corporations and the companies we choose as individuals and as companies. So, like the utilities company that I choose if I have the choice, and it also in tier two would be who Weicker chooses to partner with, and then tier three, the next level, which is happening already is those things like the standards that are applied to 
whole um, global or regional um, areas, such as like car emissions or industry pollutants and things like this. So widespread, not limited to a particular geography. So that's the glass half full. Let's turn to, again, I can't help myself, I'm a positive person. So I would say room for improvement rather than glass half empty. Um, these are areas where, you know, we have seen uh, about half of companies who now have serious disaster recovery in place. Um, many companies started that initiative around 9-11, um, but didn't necessarily cover everything, right? We were, got real focused on terrorism and things like this. We, we sort of moved away from natural disasters. So the, the uh, pandemic, of course, has lifted that somewhat. Um, the next being 70% of companies viewing sustainability as a worthy goal. You'll see in a moment that that number has already increased in a more recent survey. And then last but not least, um, we can say a majority with room to, um, for improvement have uh, in fact built a strategy and um, a business strategy on with sustainability in mind. So definitely room for improvement and a lot of it does have to do with just a more strategic approach. So Tim, let's talk about this, this is just a more uh, recent poll, and this one shows, I think, that probably the highlight for me on this slide is the last one. Uh, nearly 86% of companies now see sustainability as a worthy goal. Almost half of them to a great extent, and almost half, we'll say, 40% to some extent, at least. So again, trying to see the positive in this, um, I think we're we're getting there. We're still kind of on the ground floor, in, at least in the United States. And this was a U.S.-based poll, by the way. And so we move on to tier. Uh, sorry, we move on to the future. And my question is, maybe we're already here. Um, we're seeing online portals now for transactions so we can go to a store and not have to really touch anything. Credit cards with the tap, that was instituted years ago in Europe, but we now have it some places in the United States. Um, everything moving virtually. And then, of course, the rise of uh, these uh, accounting boards, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, um, that's the SASB. And these, um, what, what can we call them, um, compliance functions um, already exist and are particularly used in um, the government sector, but we're already starting to get requests from our new clients um, to provide information about you know, our partners and what we're doing specifically when it comes to compliance. So um, we're already in process. We have a lot more room for growth. So from there, I'd like to go back to Tim with another poll. Which sustainability initiatives will have the biggest impact on your company or program in 2021? So based on the response to the first question, I know that you might have to use your imagination a little bit, but thinking about it, uh, is it going to be moving jobs to people, introducing green initiatives with a positive impact, embracing remote wor work to reduce emissions, collaborating with suppliers on at least one ESG-related service level agreement, and then last but not least, we give you the option to write in something else. So it's a lot of choices, and I know it's hard to identify any one. If, you, uh, if you're indecisive, you can use the chat feature to say that as well, that it's more than one. So, Tim, are we getting some responses yet? We are. We're just, we usually let it go till about 80%. So if you haven't, uh, we're going to close up in about 10 seconds. So if you've not yet responded, uh, Make sure, you're, make sure that your vote is heard and counted, mm -hmm. and then we'll close it down. I'm thinking about yeah. taking a. I'm thinking about taking a guess, but I don't know. Um, right, what's the over under here? What are you thinking? <laughs> well, I think, I think a lot of jobs to people is ha happening at least in the short run because of the fact that it's still very difficult to move. 
So I think that's going to get a lot of votes because I think people already are doing that and it may be harder to see into the future. That's just my guess. Ah, I'm wrong. Remote work. Well, okay, so that's kind of similar, right? I'm going to give myself some credit. <laughs> Remote work to reduce emissions um, means essentially that the job is where you are. But um, I like the fact that people chose that because of the positive impact, right, of reducing emissions. So, so that's great. Um, I'm happy to see too. Um, a, a, almost a quarter of the folks saying that you're looking to collaborate with suppliers on at least one of these initiatives, which is terrific. And a little less on the green initiatives. I suspect that's because people just don't know what to do. So hopefully we'll find some, well, some of the uh, gems of today will be some ideas that you can take away. And did we get anything in the chat? There is one. Uh, there is one. Someone had uh, sent us in telling us that they actually uh, they anticipate more than one of these. Um, it's also uh, including positive green mindset. Um, Wonderful. So hey, it all starts mindset, with the mindset. Exactly. You have to have the exactly. mindset to get anywhere, right? Especially at the leadership level, right? If the C-suite is not embracing this, just like diversity, if the Swiss, the C-suite is not embracing it, it's very difficult to move forward. Thank you for that. Um, so Mark, um, it's time for everybody in the audience to hear a different voice. <laughs> Mark, can you, tell us, can you tell us a little bit about Hilton's role and contribution in terms of sustainable strategies and what practices uh, you're considering, considering or what practices are already in place at Hilton? Sure, yeah, Laura. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. I was happy to be um, part of um, one of these great webinars that you guys do and with all of our pals at Weikert and the great job that you guys do for us as a supplier. So happy to be part of this. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, this is a really interesting topic um, and one that's, as you mentioned, coming more to the forefront um, with companies these days. And I think particularly with what happened last year when, when the plague hit us, um, all i think we've had more opportunities as companies to even embrace this further um and do some things like remote work and so forth that have uh have been able to to get our heads kind of thinking and wheels turning on on other opportunities and what we can do i think hilton and hospitality in general um has always been at least for for our company at the forefront of um, of these types of things. We, we try to stay ahead of the game and keep our foot forward. And, and I think it goes along with the culture of our company that, um, that we like to ensure that um, we're doing everything we can. And we tie it, we tie sustainability a lot with our company with corporate social responsibility. And, and you had mentioned a little bit about that before, because it's not just going green, it's also the um, the mindset of, of what we're doing socially for the community, for others, what we can do to reduce where we need to and so forth. So we, we kind of lump it all together in the corporate social responsibility. And it's a really a big initiative with the company. Um, some of the things that I've seen recently um, as a company that we're doing is obviously once um, COVID hit last year, we had already been working on clean stay initiatives in all of our hotels and different rooms but that really came to the forefront um, once COVID hit so all of our lines of business um, out there were implementing clean stay initiatives where we had very specific protocols within our hotels of um, of social distancing stickers all over the hotels and the lobbies um, all kinds of you know different clean initiatives with having hand sanitizer um, not just in the lobbies and the elevators, but keeping folks on the first floor as much as possible, um, even when our occupancy went went down um, substantially from about 75% globally to, to 10% uh, globally once April and May of last year hit. Um, and then on top of that, just, uh, just ensuring that each room is um, cleaned and properly 
um, gone through as far as the uh, the sanitization efforts that we do, which have doubled and tripled ever since the, the pandemic hit. So it's a very, and in, in each room specifically, um, we have stickers outside of the rooms that show that we've done, we've, we've used the Clean Stay initiative in cleaning those rooms before a new occupant comes in. So, um, so that's been a huge effort of ours to continue to stay clean. And, and obviously the pandemic has, has um, helped um, get that to the forefront for us as well. Um, we, we also, I think as a company, just um, one of the things that I saw specifically in terms of helping the community is we've always had a week out of every year where we help um, give back to communities. Um, and, and again, this is more part of corporate social responsibility, but, but we do like to lump it together um, where we've gone out and partnered with various organizations out in the field to whether it's Habitat for Humanities or local shelters where our employees go out and participate and volunteer to uh, spend a day out in the field. Um, so we have a week every year that we focus on corporate social responsibility and giving back. Um, another thing that I was really touched by last year um, that we we put forth was when we had to go through a number of layoffs as a company, as, as you'd imagine with our industry being hit as hard as it was, um, that a lot of the uh, employees and team members that were laid off Unfortunately, we partnered with a number of companies like CVS, Walgreens, and others to, to help provide opportunities for those employees to then get jobs. Um, and whether that was for a short period of time or long period of time, um, we had our recruiters in-house actually work as recruiters for those employees that were laid off and then connect them with um, other companies. So another way to sort of give back, not just to our own, but um, but but as far as like a community outreach, so we really touched to be able to do that. Um, internally, we also um, on our larger benefits team have an initiative which uh, which is called the um, the the sabbatical, uh, the team member sabbatical, whereby um, we do award um, for ten people um, within the company every year a one month sabbatical where they can go back and give to a community and spend one month on paid leave on uh, doing a a really corporate social responsible effort where they can go out and we've had amazing stories where folks have gone to different countries and helped those in need in various different ways so um so we do have we do have that in place as well um, we've seen as i pointed out on my slide here um, our corporate offices have slowly reopened with just the um, leadership teams that have gone but obviously the remote work um, has has saved a lot on gasoline and emissions. And I think even in our mobility program, uh, when we've gone out and we orient assignees or at least have our first chat with transferees and assignees, we always do make the effort to kind of, um, you know, let them know pack lightly if you can, uh, you know, and then also for those specifically internationally with a transportation allowance, we do go over the fact that um, public transit is, um, you know, is, it seems to be a preferred method for a lot of our folks, particularly if they're working in an overseas um, city that where they're able to, to utilize that and stay off the road. So, you know, any little bit counts and, and anything we can do to, to help with that, um, we will. We, we also see um, that, you know, the fact that we were um, named the number one company to work for in Fortune 100 two years in a row. We, we, we really value that and um, we, we try to ensure that these types of initiatives and giving back to the community, again, are at the forefront of what we're doing as, as a company. It goes along with our culture and that, it, you know, it, it really, we want to live and breathe hospitality, create experiences for not just our uh, employees, but our customers. We feel that it's a trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. If we treat our customer, our employees, uh, excuse me, in the right way and with the right culture and so forth, then our employees, not just from the corporate perspective, but then down the line at the hotels are then going to treat the customers with that same respect and, um, you know, and bestow that every time we have an interaction with a customer and help create an experience 
at that hotel. Exactly. Um, the other, yeah. The other quick piece just on mobility, I'd say, is uh, within our own program is um, we've worked hard to get all of our files in order and, and make them electronic. Um, you can't imagine over the years the number of when I first started just kind of hearing about the numbers of files, assignment letters, employment agreements that were signed years and years ago that are in a back desk drawer somewhere in our corporate offices. And we've worked hard to kind of try and get those all together and get them electronic. Um, and, and we do the same in our corporate offices is trying to uh, go green and, and everything that we do um, with regards to paper, with regards to the kitchen and even coffee, everybody's bringing in their own mugs. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different things we do there. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll pause there. And that's just a little bit about kind of what we're doing with our company and specifically in our mobility program. The one thing I forgot to mention is um, the uh, discard and donate and then move for hunger. Those are also two things that we do. And we part, Weikert obviously helps us with initiating those um and i know we're going to talk about it a little bit later but those are yeah. great great programs i think to to help um not just uh with you know food and, and getting that out there to those in need but also discarding and donating things i mean i just went recently through a move myself and i can't imagine all the stuff that i just didn't need anymore and i was able to donate that and so when you go through it you really become accustomed to absolutely to yeah well, well, it's so great to hear how Hilton really has checked all three boxes, right? The people, the planet, and the profit, you know? it's And those are also um, the buzzwords of, of sustainability. So thank you so much for that, Mark. Um, we'll wow. now uh, take a look at Hildrup and hear from Bob. I think I'm just going to start it off by saying... Um, it, you know, because I'm so close to it and working for Weikert, I, I, it's easy for me to visualize uh, the ways in which a moving company can be more sustainable, but it may not be that obvious to everyone. And, and some of the things that you're doing are just wonderful. And I, I wouldn't have thought of them before. So please share with us uh, what's happening at Hildrup. Uh, thank you, Laura. Thanks for having me. And um... We appreciate being here and, and also part of these uh, webinars. I think the sustainability is a is a big, big topic and can go on forever with conversation. It's It's been around and it'll continue to be around uh, in the future, no question about it. You know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of different topics uh, in the world today from COVID to diversity, and we're involved in all of it, uh, as I'm sure you are at Weikert and, and Mark is at, at Hilton. But on the transportation side, you know, Hiltrip's been around for almost 120 years and focusing on the corporate community of, you know, corporate relocations, both domestically and internationally. And it's going to continue to evolve. So as an organization, we've always tried to be a good partner, collaborative, innovative with our clients and the folks that we work with because the companies and the corporations out there are also require it as well on the partners they have on the service side of it. So the longevity of our business, it's important that we are a good uh, corporate citizen and a, and a partner and we value that. So we've taken steps on the sustainability side uh, for years, and we will continue to do that as we move forward. In, internally at Hildrip, in our offices, in our organization, we've taken the steps to go green on a lot of fronts. We've got motion detectors through the offices, so if no one's in the rooms when uh, they're in there operating, the lights will turn off and automatically turn on. We've got, uh, you know, the plumbing systems throughout the laboratories are controlling the amount of water that goes through those. So we're not wasting water. We receive, recycle paper in our offices so we can reuse it. We recycle moving boxes. So when we're doing a corporate uh, relocation and there's the boxes that are left over after someone is delivered and unpacked in still good usable condition, we re repurpose those. All right. We will take those and give those to someone else who may be moving on their own that really can't afford that packing material. And then the boxes that are left over, they'll go through a recycling uh, uh, you know, process to make sure that we're, we're taking that and using it. A um, couple of the things that we done you know, recently, so the video survey we've done for 
a number of years because we felt that it was the direction that we needed to go in as we get uh, moving forward and the generations are younger and younger, they're more working off of these handheld devices and electronics and technology is going to be a big big part of what we do in the future on everyone's business. And it's no different in the transportation business, it's no different in the moving and storage business. So when you talk to somebody about video surveying, we've done it prior to COVID and then it became a mandate that we had to do it uh, during COVID because nobody wanted anybody in and out of their homes. So at Hildrup, we've got about nine people that are full-time that handle uh, virtual survey seven days a week uh, throughout the day into the night. And we find that it's worked out very, very well for us. In the pack, in, you know, people can do it on their, their own schedule at home, uh, it's the comfort in their home. We have a, it's a video survey. It's almost like a FaceTime. It's all secured, so there's no issue uh, with any of that uh, privacy. And we have a copy of the video of the survey in the end. So if there's ever a question on a claim or a service or something, we have that record and it's worked out great. They're actually almost more accurate than an in-home survey. But by doing that, we obviously want to measure what we're doing there. And by doing the uh, virtual surveys and we look at 2020, we feel because we did not have people going into the homes to do the surveys, there is uh, almost 2,200 gallons of gasoline saved by doing the virtual surveys, which was fantastic. Everybody in most of the offices now work in remote and there's 10 locations in the Hildrick organization up and down the East Coast with everybody working from home. We measure that as well, right? 22,000 hours, you know, work remotely and reducing the carbon footprint, which is also a, a key for us. Um, one of the things that we did and I, I had you know two Tesla trucks, we've actually got five on order, but the problem is is that we can't get them because they're on back order. And those Tesla trucks are totally electric. So we will put a charging station in our facility and we will work with the charging stations in the areas that we travel. So that way we again are going green, but from a corporate side of it, and the corporations that we work with and that are continually calling on and, and, and down the road who will be future customers, this will be an important topic because they're going to want to partner with somebody who's green, who understands sustainability. What are you doing about it? How do you partner with us? You know, Mark had touched on being good, you know, community and uh, citizen you know, with giving back. We, we do the same thing, you know, move for hunger, discard and donate. We're big proponents of that, have been for a long time. We do a lot of work for the American Heart Association, United, United Way and other organizations where we can give back to the community with our folks who are happy to do it. And it's gone out very, very well. It's always been in the footprint and the fabric of what, uh, what makes Hildrup the company they are. And it's gone very, very well and well received, and we will continue to do that. And the younger folks that work for us, the Generation X, Zs, and, and whatever the next letter is, they are already in tune with that from when they're growing up because recycling is a big uh, effort for everybody, you know, recycling from home and making sure that you're, you know, putting the plastic with the plastic, the paper with the paper, and so on. And so it's no different. And so when people come in to our company or you know corporations that we're working with and the and the new buyers of our services, they kind of expect that. So what are you doing on the sustainability side of it? So you have to be in that realm to be relevant. So you're going to be present. So you're going to be able to do the things that you need to do to keep going forward. And and last as an organization, as we continue to bring in new people in our organization, you know, and just the success of the business, they're younger and they have all of these different types of focuses, whether it's the diversity, uh, giving back to the community or the sustainability that they already know about it. So when you start to bring these items up and we do a lot of charitable uh, organization donations. We have events that we bring our people in to be part of. They're the first ones to raise their hand and want to be part of it. So it says a lot for the education that's come up through the ranks and then what we're able to do with that. We um one of the last items on here is is you know the reusable worksite materials and we measure a lot of this because we want to know how successful we are with what we are doing. So it has here 213 tons of office paper recycled from all the held up locations. So we are always recycling paper. We measure it on, on the tonnage because we want to know how impact we are doing with it. Can we get better? Can we grow with it? You know, and we, we look at 
like I said, the repurposable uh, packing material, as I mentioned earlier, if we can reuse it, we reuse it. If not, we recycle it. And then it goes, you know, along with the other steps that we're taking. And we have thermostats throughout our buildings that are set to go, you know, they're, they're on timers. So when one, no one's in the building, those the heat goes down. And so when, when you know, office starts an hour before, the heat will get, you know, up to where it's acceptable for everyone. But we're continually learning. We're continually growing. We're trying to find new opportunities. We're open to, uh, you know, different services or different products, whatever we can we can work with on our office moving side. We use plastic crates when we do an office move as opposed to cardboard boxes. Those plastic crates are reusable. We use a plastic masonite material on the floors where we used to use wood before and the plastic is reusable and it works. So there's a lot of different um, ways to approach it and we want to stay uh, on top of it. We want to be in front of it and we're open to suggestions. We value the relationships we have in the corporate community. You know, we all get measured today on a lot of different levels. And most of the business that we do on a lot of the business that we do is all scorecard driven. So you're, you're really, you know, you're got to be responsible for that scorecard. So we, we've done well with it. We got more to go and we look forward to the future. So um I won't, I won't talk anymore and let, let us continue on with the presentation, so. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, it's, it's great. Uh, the one that was a little bit of a surprise to me, it never occurred to me, was, you know, having electric trucks. Uh, amazing, amazing. I mean, I, and, and then on the, you know, on that tier one level, on the individual level, I'm seeing more and more charging stations going up. Uh, I live in a condo and they're talking about putting them in, in our, you know, our spaces that are available to guests and residents. And yeah, I mean, it's like, if you build, hopefully they'll come. I, I know that once it's in, I'm very much a candidate for an electric car. So, <laughs> and I'm yeah, driving. I mean, it's an yeah. Expensive investment. And I'm not sure everybody will want to buy onto it, but it's going to be part of the future. So as we start to look at, you know, companies down the road that want to work with Hildrip and they were, you're, you're going to have to be in that realm. You know, what are you doing to save the environment? And those Tesla trucks, those electric trucks, I mean, they're high demand. Like I said, we've had it autumn for a couple of years. They have our money and a lot of it. Uh, we'll see when they come, but the it needs to happen. It needs to happen. So, well, I know we have a few car company folks on the line today. So I just want to share that I've been a hybrid owner for I don't even know how many years. <laughs> I was one of the first Prius owners. So thank you, Toyota. Um, but anyway, um, there, you know, there's some things that we can tell you about, too, when it comes to Weikert's initiatives. I saw that there was a question that came in, um, you know, about Weikert and do we let me see what exactly what it said. Um, where was it? Well, it was a question about whether or not we're asked to show our um, stats. And I want to tell you that it is definitely becoming a question that we see on RFPs for what our own efforts are in the realm of sustainability. So um, we have, I put up here the discard and donate and the move for hunger because those are pretty much, you know, we start with the premise that our client, we offer those to all of our clients as opportunities for saving. And, you know, not everyone does it, but but uh, it's certainly available. Um, I grabbed some statistics because the, the numbers are constantly changing. Um, even from the last time Bob and Mark and I presented, um, we're now up to something like a million pounds of uh, discarded or, you know, donated items. Um, there's been... 700,000 meals donated to Move for Hunger. And since inception of Move for Hunger, 2.5 million meals. So that's pretty impressive. I mean, there haven't been around, I don't remember how long they've been around, but it's not that long. So in terms of what Weikert does, on behalf of our clients, we promote these. Of course, in our offices, we do our best with recycling and shredding and all that. Um, many of us have made great efforts to be paper free. Um, and then, of course, in, in, our, in our side of the business, it's a lot to do with the social pillar of the ESG, right? It has to do a lot with the idea that if we support our people and we provide a good work experience, that that will translate over into our, our clients and customer services. So um, we can, and, and of course, we've also adopted um, 
a, a diversity, equity, and inclusiveness initiative that actually just launched in, you know, company-wide this year. We were already piloting it, but now everyone in our organization is encouraged, mandated to um, take this training. Um, so from here, let's move on. Tim, um, to the next in terms of some of the lessons learned when it comes to um, sustainability. Um, I think for me, it's not just um, the right thing to do. I th for me, that's first. It's the right thing to do. Um, but it also, by the way, happens to be good for business, good for strategic planning, and produces win-win solutions. So however you look at it, um, you know, making an effort towards being more sustainable it has only good outcomes as far as I can see. Um, you know, in terms of, we learned this year in business continuity, we learned the importance of having policies that, um, you know, promote uh, things like death, disaster relief, relief emergency. And, and in, in this year, it turned into um, a heavy emphasis on setting people up to be able to work from home, which, as we said, has resulted in some environmental impact. Um, we anticipate, in, anticipate based on the past year that although movement, you know, volume is coming back, uh, it's still not coming back to where, you know, it was in the past. And there's a high likelihood that there'll be fewer moves, but they'll be much more strategic and there'll be the opportunity to really look at moves that are going to be folks who are developing in their careers. And, and with that, in retention will go up, which is another aspect of sustainability. And last but not least, I think we heard between the three of us, I think we covered all three, the people, the planet, and the profit. So we've got another poll. And Tim, I'm gonna ask you to put that up. So this is our last poll. Which of the following ESG initiatives do you think transferees and assignees care most about reducing the carbon footprint of their move, being a good corporate citizen, ensuring the employee's well-being during and after the move, demonstrating more inclusivity within the mobile workforce, and last but not least, the ability to leverage cultural skills. So again, we ask or uh, we ask panelists, organizers, and Weikert attendees to refrain from answering. And, and uh, as those come in, I'm just going to add here that uh, through the chat feature, lots of great comments from folks um, joining us today for the efforts of Hilton and Hildrup. Um, a lot of nice comments from folks who are soundly impressed with the efforts that these two organizations are taking. So that's always good to see as well. Wonderful. Yeah, I saw that one of the questions was, do you think a company's sustainability efforts have an impact on attracting top talent? Well, we might find that out from this poll. Um, my, my feeling about it is absolutely yes. I think that, you know, because millennials and Gen Zs are, they say within five years will represent 75% of the workforce. I would say absolutely. It, it helps. So what was number one? Ensuring the employee's well-being during and after the move. Well, that is certainly very important. Duty of care is absolutely critical. And I think in this past year, we really learned that. And so many of our clients relied on us more than ever for, for help in that regard. And, and their internal mobility functions told us that the rest of the organization valued global mobility more than ever before because of the work we were able to do in collaboration to help ensure the, the health and welfare and safety of employees. Um, I'm happy to see that reducing carbon footprint is, is creeping up. And you know the other the other areas too. Uh, still a little low, but you know, as I said from the beginning, I think this is a, a an up and coming topic. And I think if we were to run this same poll in a year from now, I th I I am confident we would see all these numbers increasing. So thank you for that. And we can move the other way back to some of the silver linings that we've already talked about. Thank you. Um, so yes, a big resounding yes to the ability to increase um, 
the attractiveness of our companies to new talent when we take initiatives, whether they are corporate social responsibility or environmental. So I think everyone likes to be able to say, be proud of working for a company that is progressive in this way. And in turn, it also improves employee engagement. I love Mark's example of, you know, the volunteering. It's wonderful. I, I mean, feel good things are really critical these days. Um, and then in terms of achieving flexibility, I think we really learned, uh, and Bob gave some great examples too, by being more flexible, by using technology, we've saved so much money on these um, surveys by being able to do them virtually. Um, and then protecting the health of the signees, you know, that even comes down to things like destination services, being able to do virtual tours instead of being face to face. And from what I'm hearing, many of these virtual um, opportunities that were put into place, I, I think they're going to stay as oper options for people who are still uncomfortable, um, options for people who are still living in places where, you know, it's not even right. The pandemic is better in some places than others so having options and also having you know maybe some companies are looking i think many companies are looking for cost savings so if if a little money can be saved by replacing a pre-decision trip with a, an elaborate virtual tour wonderful you mm -hmm. know so i do think that some of the things that have come into play in this past year and a half or so our long-term um, cost savings and just flexible options that we see. And then, um, of course, you know, there is no doubt an investment in local talent um, that's happening uh, where moves have not been able to take place. Um, so that is a factor that we can't ignore. And then uh, last but not least, um, which we really didn't get into much today, is the diversity aspect. This whole thing of virtual uh, levels the playing field and makes it possible for a much more diverse workforce to stand up or, or raise their hand to volunteer um, for an opportunity for an assignment and to learn more about it without making um, you know, the physical commitment of going somewhere by being able to do it virtually. So many silver linings available. Um, I'd like to, uh, we, have, we have about nine minutes left, which is nice. I'd like to turn it um, to first to Tim to let us know if there are any more questions that have come in. There are a couple that I've, I've flipped over to you, but this one here oh, sorry, just came please. in and someone has asked, um, is the ESG interest impacting recruiting? Do new hires want to know how their employer is supporting these ESG initiatives? Um, I think, Mark, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, and then I'll I'll add to it if there's something to add. Yeah, sure. No, that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, we haven't seen um, specifically some of those questions come through. Um, with recruit, at least I haven't heard as much, but I do think now, specifically with how the last year has been, um, there's much more opportunity for those types of questions from potential candidates who are interviewing um, to to be asking to our recruiters and vice versa. Um, recruiters within our company, um, you know, asking potential candidates uh, about. I will say that um, we we frequently have um, town hall events or um, events within our company for corporate and hotel ops where uh, where we have guest speakers come in out in the field on um, whether it's business acumen, diversity, leadership, what have you. And one of the recent things I've noticed is that when we do in in one recent uh, event that we had. Um, is that we don't just hire for the cultural fit, but also what the cultural contribution can be. And what we mean by that is um, you obviously get a good vibe for a candidate when you are, you know, interviewing them from a recruiting aspect in person, but, um, but also trying to figure out what are the types of things they do outside of work and how they are and how they behave and, you know, knowing, um, where somebody's experience uh, can be in this regard, with regard to sustainability, going green efforts, helping the community, all of that I think can go a long way, particularly 
with a position within hospitality and with Hilton because it really is the DNA of who we are, who we are as people serving people. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, I think it, it definitely the future is bright for, for where that's headed. Um, and I do, I, I do see that in, in recruiting going forward. Excellent. Thanks. So Bob, you got a nice shout out. Um, honestly, wouldn't have expected a relocation company already being that green. Hope that more companies will go the Hildreth way. So, Bob, um, that's that's great compliment. Um, I'm just curious, are your how do your employees feel? Do you think that your being so progressive is? Do you think people walk around feeling good about working for Hildreth? I do. I, I think that you know I. When you look at bringing someone on board and you ask them to do certain things now in today's world with the covid situation and having crews going into homes and we're taking their temperature when they come to the office in the morning before they go to the job sites to get in the trucks and do everything you need to do to be proactive they don't fight it wearing masks i mean you all know what it's like to wear a mask and how uncomfortable it is. Try to move furniture and go in and out of homes and 100 degree heat, depending on where you're working in the country, and have to stay with that all day long. It's tough. You know, when you're working out for an hour, I know people fight it and they can't deal with it. Try to deal with it every day, all day. So I think that the, you know, the teams that we have out there and internally, even the office staff, they're accepted to it. And, and you know, they have no, you know, no problems with it. And I think everybody looks at it as, you know, I'm, I'm with a progressive company, we're trying to do the right thing, and we're only gonna get better as we move forward because it's in everybody's life, no matter what you do, either you're walking into a, a store, a hotel, or a restaurant, and there's, you know, things on the floor and six feet apart and so on, it's, all, it's just all part of it. So, um, you know, everybody is is good with it. And I will tell you this, when we do the, the um, you know, they give back and we do a lot of giving back to the community and we ask for volunteers, whether it's a walk, a run, a volunteer to give, you know, food, however we're doing with homeless shelters, we always have a good response to that. And we always have people willing to raise their hands to get on board, young and old. So it's a nice, it's just a nice thing to see. It's a good environment. Great. Well, I see one more um, question which is do we, any th of the three of us, have advice on how to sell sustainability strategies to leadership, particularly if they view it as a cost add? A good, that's a good question. Um, I'll start by saying, I, I think, well, first of all, I think a lot of it is not a cost add. Um, we, you know, the technology has been in place for things like Bob mentioned, you know, like the surveys, for example, and the technology was in place to some extent on virtual tours. They just became more elaborate. So maybe there was some investment in, in better technology, but in the long run, I think we have to look at the long view of the, the cost savings of offering options that don't require people to go places, um, whatever that means, an airplane or just driving around in a car um, doing those surveys. So that's that's part of it. The other is um, metrics. I mean, now these things are becoming more measurable. So it is possible to look at the cost savings. And, um, you know, we can talk about, we, we provided some metrics today. Move for Hunger is able to say how many meals they've donated and discard donate. They can provide metrics as well. So I think it's a short-term cost for a long-term gain. Um, so that would be one of mine. And that, that's when it comes to the more green things. Obviously, for diversity, equity, and inclusiveness, it's a different sell completely. Um, but I think retention goes into it as well and it is still somewhat elusive i'm not going to lie it's it's a little bit like the 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 famous return on investment you know being able to measure it is tantamount to being able to sell it so that's my two cents um bob mark anything to add there i mean i'd say um you covered it pretty well laura i mean i'd probably echo that um based on the first poll question it sounds like there there's a lot of companies or organizations that haven't done too much and so that's a you know good question that what, what can we do how do we get it in front of leadership 
I think it's the type of topic that I think you said it shouldn't cost that much because what you're trying to do is 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 reduce or do good things, whether it's for the environment, the community, um, to give back. And I, I would think that the efforts surrounding that would only be welcomed by good leaders um, out there and they would make the time to to you know to sit with you if you had some good ideas and and take that on so i wouldn't see you know any any harm in trying to bring that to leadership and say this is something we ought to be thinking about um to make us not just a more attractive organization for potential candidates but but internally just a feel good uh you know a feel good thing for our employees and um, I would just, you know, I would, I would encourage somebody to just get a, an invite and a meeting on the calendar uh, with that leader just to have an initial dialogue and discussion about it and bring up some ideas. And I, I can't see why they wouldn't welcome it. Right. The only thing, the only thing I would add to that, Laura, is I think in, in the leadership role, I mean, to sell it to a leadership, when you look at it in the vertical you're in, What's your competition doing? Do you want to be a leader or do you want to be a follower? This this topic is not going to go away and it's going to become more prevalent as we move on. So these leaders that don't buy onto this or don't grasp it may find themselves in a in an uncompromising spot where their competitors in their space, whatever business line you're in, are finding that they're going ahead and you're not. And I don't think anybody can afford that today. So I think leadership would have a probably an open ear to it if they understand you know what's out there and somebody that's not working on this already is obviously living in a cave because it's it's in our lives every day with everything we do so great great place to end thank you so much excellent and um, we have we we always invite folks to visit whitegoodworkforcemobility.com and our blog um, some great blog post reading on sustainability. Uh, some of you may recall that this same panel uh, did a very well received session on this topic at uh, the fall uh, GWS and uh, we have a couple of blog posts pertaining to that which you can find there but we also encourage you to peruse our library of white papers uh, while you're at our website. But uh, When you have a moment uh, please do visit uh, whitegoodworkforcemobility.com and for those of you here wanting to collect some continuing education credits, uh, we will mail the list of attendees to CERC, so you're all set there for Worldwide ERC. You want to apply for your own, and the session ID is right there, 16476. With that, um, I just want to take a moment to thank Bob and Mark uh, for, and your organizations, Hildrup and Hilton, uh, for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, and thanks to Laura for spearheading not just this webinar, but also our thought leadership in this area. And lastly, thanks to our audience members for being part of today's program and for your questions and poll input. It makes it more interactive and, and we like that. Everyone, everyone gets a little bit more when everyone, when everyone participates. So once again, thank you and please be on the lookout for further webinars and we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Be safe.